praise you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to pick it up with a message we started last week. Second Corinthians chapter 5. We probably don't need to turn there. We can probably all quote this verse. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, it's amazing that when we are saved, when we give our life to Jesus, the greatest miracle that we'll ever know takes place within us. God reaches in. And takes out the heart of stone, the heart of sin, the sin nature. Takes it out of us and he puts back into in us a heart of righteousness. A heart made in the image of God. A heart made in the image of righteousness. A heart of love. And uh, we become a new creation. You're not who you used to be. Your very inner being, your spirit man has been regened. You've reached, you received a genetic transplant of the very nature of God. In Romans, Paul talks about the olive branch being national Israel, that branches were cut out because of unbelief, but because of their unbelief, the Gentiles have been able to be grafted in. Well, what happens when a branch is grafted into a tree? It starts receiving the nourishment of the tree. Amen. And we, in the same way, are grafted into Jesus. We're not who we used to be. We have access to, to the blessings of a whole new kingdom, right? A whole new realm. And the problem is that so many Christians... They get born again. They don't know uh, that a supernatural change has taken place. They may know that their sins have been washed away. They may know that they've been forgiven of sins, but they don't know they've been changed. So what happens because they don't know they've been changed, even though a change took place on the inside, they can't manifest it on the outside. Because as long as you still think you're a sinner, as long as you still think you're filthy, filthy rags or you know, you're a worm before God, you'll keep acting in that fashion. You'll keep expecting yourself to fall short, to fail, to sin, to mess up. But once we, once we discover that God's made you new creation, amen, look at verse 21. For he has made him, Jesus, the Father God has made him Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made, recreated, regened, the righteousness of God, in him. Once you discover you've been made a new creation, it allows you to change how you think regarding who you are. It, it allows you to change how you act, how you speak, how you respond to situations. Once you recognize you're an eternal being, temporal things have much less impact on you. Well, you just don't know what they said to me. Well, I know how long I'm going to live eternally. And in a thousand years, I'm not going to care what they said. In fact, we could even put it this way. How many of you have been offended by what something said in the past and you don't remember even who it was or what it was now? I mean, can you remember anybody saying anything mean to you when you were in high school? I'm sure it happened, but I can't remember anybody saying it. But how many times in high school are young people offended about what somebody said at school? Yet, a decade or two later, you don't even remember the person, much less what they said. It just doesn't matter once you recognize you're an eternal being. And so, as well, once you recognize you're an eternal being, you set your sights on eternal attributes in your life. Amen. You want to, you want to be changed. So one of the most important things we can learn once we're born again is that we can be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Again, very common verses to us. Are you there? This really reads interesting in the Passion Bible as well. In fact, let me get one just for fun. We were talking about the Passion Bible right before the Word tonight. I've been reading out of this translation and really enjoy some of the they put on the word. So let me get to Romans. There we go. Chapter 12, verse 1. Let me read the first two verses. 
Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God, to be a sacred living sacrifices, and live in holiness, experiencing all the delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. What a powerful verse right there. Then we are conformed to the image of God. We let the word change us. It virtually is what pleases God. It's a form of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit to a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Now the King James says, be not conformed to this world, right? Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't let the world press you into its mold, as we've heard in the past. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Once you're born again, you want to let the word change how you think. Change how you perceive yourself. Change what you expect from yourself. I mean, as long as you're confessing yourself as, as a sinner, you'll expect yourself to sin. But if you call yourself the righteousness of God, you'll expect yourself to live holy. Amen. It empowers you to virtually be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. The Word has the ability to change you. It's alive and powerful, right? And if we'll let it, if we'll meditate on it, let it get down within us, It'll allow what's on the inside of us get to the outside of us. I was meditating earlier today about trees of righteousness. The word, the word calls us trees of righteousness. And, you know, there's a lot of trees out there right now that if you drove by them, unless you're a tree expert, you probably wouldn't know what they were. I mean, right now, if you drove beside an apple tree, a pear tree, a peach tree, whatever kind of tree, you probably couldn't tell anybody what kind it was. Probably couldn't even tell them whether it was a fruit tree or not. Amen. As some people are, you know, familiar with the different barks and shapes and stuff, they can tell you, I'm not that well familiar. Amen. And so uh, that tree has within it a certain code to produce a certain type of leaf, a certain type of fruit, if it's a fruit tree, right? And the Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter 3 that where you're rooted and grounded in love, basically is trees. And so a tree is rooted into the soil of the earth, right? And that tree, when it's growing season, will absorb the nutrients out of the soil, the moisture out of the soil, bring in the, the, the energy from uh, photosynthesis from the sun, combine those together and produce leaves and fruit. And once it produces the leaves and fruit, then you can know what kind it is. In fact, if the leaves are on a tree, I couldn't tell you if it's, but no fruit, I couldn't tell you if it's an apple tree or a cherry tree. Or a pear tree. I couldn't tell you. But once the fruit appears, then I can tell you that's an apple tree. And then I'm waiting for the fruit to get ripe. Once I see apples, I'm waiting for the fruit to get ripe. Once I see pears, come on pears. I love Pears. Amen. And so uh, the fruit determines or lets you know what kind of tree it is. In fact, Jesus said, you will know my disciples by their fruit. Right? You'll know them by their fruit. And so until a tree produces its fruit, or especially its leaves, I mean, if nothing else is leaves, you don't know what kind of tree it is. Amen. And until a Christian produces fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and on and on, you don't know whether they're really a Christian. So you can be changed on the inside, but until you let the change on the inside get to the outside, people really don't know there's been a transformation. I mean, if I just lined up 15 people across here, pulled them off the street, you couldn't look at them and tell me if they're a Christian or not. The only indication you would have whether they're a Christian or not is to watch them and see if there's an anointing on their life. Amen. Maybe even see if there's godly actions and words coming out of their life and out of their mouth. But without them just standing there, you wouldn't know. 
And we as God's trees are assigned to change, to give off a fruit, to give off an appearance, to give off actions that indicate we're saved. Amen. But the only way you can really effectively do that is by knowing you've been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. So let's go on over to the other verse passage we were in last week and pick it up again from there. Ephesians chapter 4. BJ, I have an announcement I made earlier. Hang around so you can hear it tonight, okay? Don't go rushing out of here. Somebody will have to tackle you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 says, But you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, say put off, that you put off concerning the former conversation or lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now here he says, and he's talking to Christians here, and he says, starting out, you got to put off the old man. You got to put off the old actions of sin, the old words of decreeing the curse over your life. You got to you got to put off things that that indicate to people you've not really been transformed. Amen. Patty and I saw a movie last night, and in the movie, this guy came into a a place and he was talking to this girl, and she wouldn't have anything really to do with him because he said she said you're wearing a cheap suit that you're wearing a suit that cheap, you don't have any money, you can't afford me. I'm not talking about buying it in the way you're thinking, but basically she was looking for somebody with more money. And so it turns around, he gets some money, he comes back in with a nice suit, and all of a sudden she's interested in him. In other words, the clothes indicated the status of the man. And he had to put off the old, which was not attractive. I'm not saying, you know, make decisions based on somebody's clothes, you understand. I'll give you an example. He had to put off the old clothes to put on the new ones to attract the person to him. Well, in the same way, we've got to put off the old ones we're born again. Because if we don't, you can be born again, but if you don't put off the old, people won't know you've been changed. I don't know how it was when you got saved, but I know how it was when I got saved. They knew my old clothes. I mean, everybody around me, people still today will say, you used to wear some really ragged clothes. You know, I'm talking about ragged clothes, right? I'm not talking about they really look bad. I wore some nicer clothes, but, but my past was, let's just say, somewhat contaminated. And so uh, once I got saved, everybody was watching me. We'll see if this is real. We'll see if it's genuine. We know you. I had people come to me. I was getting married. And people come and say, your marriage won't last. We know who you are. Now, I hadn't been saved yet. I got saved a few months later. And they probably were right. But I got saved, praise God, just a few months after. But once I got saved, all my coworkers, family members, friends are looking at me, and they're watching to see if I'm going to keep the old clothes on. But I made a decision right away. If God was real, I wanted to honor him. And one of the first thing I, things I did once I got saved, I put on some new clothes. Now, I really took off the old ones. I may have been running around scantily dressed for a while, but I put off the old ones. I wasn't drinking anymore, drugging, anything that went with it. I, was, I put those old things off and endeavored to get in the Word to, put, to find out what do I put on now. I really didn't know what to put on. I really didn't. You know, I didn't know I could put on a robe of righteousness. I didn't know I could put on armor of God. I didn't know I could put on the love of God and bear the fruit of the Spirit. I thought, you know, maybe I can just do some good deeds. Well, praise God for good deeds. Amen. They'll indicate some type of a change, but God's looking for a whole new outfit versus just one that spiffed up a little bit that you knock the dust off of. 
And so uh, I was being watched to see if I'd make changes. And now 35 years later, been over 35 years since I gave my life to Christ, I think it stuck pretty good. Amen? And I'm definitely wearing some clothes different than I used to wear. Now, I want some better ones. Again, I'm not talking about natural clothes. I'm talking about serving God, clothed with the glory of God. But uh, we're marching that direction. But you've got to be willing to put some things off before you can put on, right? So he said, put on the old man so you can put on. We talked about the old man last week. So you can put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. And see, there's a two-part outfit. Amen. I mean, when, when a guy's putting on his clothes, he usually put on two major items, pants and a shirt. Maybe been a day I went without a shirt, but not anymore. There's too much to expose. Amen. You don't want to see that. So there's two pieces. There's a lower part and an upper part. Amen. And when you're putting on the new man, the first thing is put on is the righteous nature. I mean, when you get saved, God gives you that new nature. You've been made righteous, right? That's we could call it maybe the lower part. It's unseen. If I'm, but now God wants you to put on the seen part. Put on true holiness. See, I believe sometimes the words will jump around. Sometimes righteousness can mean holiness, and it always has that indication. But I think one definition we can apply to these words is righteousness is your new nature. And holiness is your new response to a righteous nature. Do you follow me? Righteousness is the trunk of the tree, but holiness is the fruit. What's on the branches? Holiness is what people see. And so you may be made righteous, but until you put on holiness, they don't know what change has been made. So he says, put on these things. Put away lying is the next verse. He's just listing things that we as, as believers shouldn't have in our lives. There should be a definite shift in our lives once we're born again. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, uh, Seeing we are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, lay, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race set before us, right? Looking unto Jesus. So once you're saved, you're to put aside sin. You're to get rid of the weights. Now, I believe sin are those things we would recognize are unpleasing to God. Lying, cheating, stealing, you know, uh, uh, hurting people's feelings unnecessarily. Those would be sin. But weights, I believe, are things that just distract you from your call of God. Things that weigh you down, that steal your time, so you don't have time enough time for the Word or for prayer or to seek God or to know God. And he said, lay these things aside so you can run the race set before you. We're to be running into this thing. Have you seen these uh, shows, uh, these acts they've had lately, the quick change artists? You know what I'm talking about, the quick change artists? They're on America's Got Talent quite a bit. Pastor Rebecca, in your convenience, find me a video on quick change artists. We'll put it on the TV toward the end. What they do is they take these people, they call them quick change artists, and there'll be a girl or a guy and she'll be wearing one outfit, and they'll wave a banner past her, and next she's got a different outfit on. Then they'll wave it again, she's got a different outfit on. She may go through 15 outfits for with just boom, boom, boom. Like one is they'll throw glitter up in the air as it showers past her. When it comes past her, she's in a different outfit. What happens? She's running into new clothes, if we can put it in that fashion. She is shifting clothes quickly, and we're running the race. We should be running to change what we're manifesting outwardly to the, to the world. We put off as quick as we can, and we put on as quick as we can. Amen. And be saying, God, help me change what I'm displaying to the world. Now, here's the problem. A lot of people are trying to change what they're presenting to the world. And because they don't understand the supernatural power of God to assist them in the change, they're trying to do it by their own ability. So they're trying to do a series of good deeds. They're trying to be forgiving. They're trying to be patient. 
They've learned to count to ten. You know, they, 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 they've learned not to cuss people out until they get stretched so far, and they're doing it by their own ability. And eventually, your ability, if not refreshed by the power of God, the presence of God, your ability will finally run out. Your tank will run dry. And then people are going to get unloaded on in a fashion they didn't know possible from a Christian. Amen? They're going to find out how quick you put off and then put on and how quick you put back off and on again. Amen? I mean, they found out you didn't really get rid of those old clothes. You just had them in the back, you know, in your backpack, and you, you put those things on real quick because you're trying to do it of yourself. Therefore, the only genuine way to put on the articles of God, the outfits of God, is by faith in God's ability. How can I say this? To bear fruit in your life supernaturally. And you're saying, God, I want supernatural love. I want supernatural peace. Father, just don't have me forgive this person because I'm just determined to. Spirit of God, go down inside of me and remove the offense. Remove the pain. Deliver me from this. Help me genuinely forgive this person. Help me really put it to the side. Let it never bother me again. Remind me not to meditate on the offense, whatever you've got to do. And you ask God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to enable you to live a supernatural, fruitful life. Supernatural joy. Supernatural peace. You place a demand on the anointing. Amen? You learn to worship God when you feel like you're stretched thin to refuel your tank. You learn to, you learn to, to speak the word when it looks like you know, you're falling short or things are rising up against you. You speak the word. And you let the word carry the load. I uh, was blessed with two daughters in life, love them greatly, but I didn't have any sons. Amen. I won't blame my wife tonight, but <laughs> she always wants to quote me genetics. I didn't have any sons, and we quit before we did. And uh, therefore, all of my days... If there's something to be carried, I pretty much have to carry it. I have to transport it. And uh, many times I've had to carry some pretty heavy loads. Amen. But I found out if there's something really heavy to carry, like a refrigerator or you know, a washing machine or something like that, I have these dollies. In fact, I don't know how many dollies I have at home. I have several different kinds. Flat ones, push cart ones couple of them with handles, you know, several dollars. And uh, I'd say five or six of them. Depending on what I'm moving, I'll grab that dolly. Not to mention, one of the greatest inventions ever made were furniture sliders. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The little round rock tagonal things you put under the furniture and you push it around on the carpet. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. Patty has this china cabinet that weighs three million pounds. I have it to move it a few times. It's all I can do to lift one end to get a slider under. I'll lift it and kick the slider under. And then I can just push it around. Thank you, Lord God. But what I found is when I use the furniture sliders, or especially the dollies, I may put, you know, I may put a 300 pound load on a dolly. The ice cream machine we had at one time. That ice cream machine back right over there, I bet weighs 700 pounds or more. I don't know what it weighs. It's heavy. You can't hardly move it, much less lift it. But yet I brought it from Illinois, loaded it myself, brought it here, unloaded it myself, and put it in. We had some help unloading it, didn't we? I think we did. Me and Barry, anyway. Well, the old one we had was 300 pounds, and I moved it in myself, moved it out myself several times. Anyway, when I put the piece of equipment on a dolly, and I just pull the handle back, I may apply 30 pounds of force on the dolly handle, but I'm lifting 300 with the dolly. Thank goodness for leverage. Makes you want to study physics right there, doesn't it? Amen. Archimedes says, give me a lever long enough and a, and a place to, 
and a place to put it, and I will move the world. He understood the, the power of leverage. So the leverage of a dolly lets me apply little force but move great weights. What are you getting at, Pastor Jack? That's what the Word does. The Word is designed to carry the weight for you. The pressures of life, the responsibilities, the needs, your supply coming in, the Word is designed by God. When activated by faith, brings to you all that you need to carry the load. I found out I can't carry the load of, of pastoring myself. Amen? I, it, would, it would sink me. I can't carry the load of just paying the bills on this church. It would overwhelm me. <laughs> I can't carry the load of putting together all the messages that are required. Amen for different things. So what do I do? I turn it over to God. I heard Jesse the plan us preach this years ago. And I heard him this, this year alone say he's never ran a deficit in his ministry. But he would have major bills come in. Maybe $50,000 of bills hit his desk. And he would say, God, you have mail. You call me this ministry. It's your ministry. You have mail. There's bills to pay and the money would come in. I have learned to do that. To say, God, you have mail. And I'm not fretting over it anymore. Used to bother me. Mm -mm, not anymore. I'm, I'm giving it to God. Amen. There's always levels of giving it. But I'm determined it stays in God's hands. And so, once I gave it to God, all of a sudden he's paying the bills. And the minute it comes in, I never know how it's going to come in, but it seems to come in. And the bills get paid. Thank you, Jesus. What happened? I put that load on the dolly of the word. And, and, and so whatever it is, the responsibilities of trying to keep up with everybody. You know, who's come to church? Who isn't God? They're your sheep. I'm just shepherding them. You follow me? I'm, 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 I'm the man you've put in charge of shepherding, but you got to tell me if there's something needed. And so it takes the pressure off of me. I put it on the word. Amen. And you can do that with your health, your finances, your children being saved, your family serving God. Just give it over to the word of God. Speak the word and let the word carry the load. Amen. And in doing so, it lets you access, how can I say, the supply and the strengthening power of God supernaturally versus have to do it by yourself. Because if you're putting on what you've already had in the past, it's not what God wants you to wear. He wants you to put on the new man. Amen? We run to do it by ourselves all of our lives, but it's time to let God carry this load. So we are called to be new creations, bear fruit unto God, let the world actually see that God is a supernatural God. The vast majority of Christianity, not attacking anybody, but the vast majority of Christianity is still not understanding that our Christian walk should be supernatural. You should have the presence of God on you. You should carry an anointing. You should have faith in the word of God to produce for you. Yet most of you are just trying to, well, I got saved back in, you know, 73, uh, and, and I've been trying to serve God ever since. I'm hanging on. There's more to it than that. We're now citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We should be putting off the old, which was natural clothing. In fact, we could put it like that. The old you're putting off is not just sin, but it's life Life, how can I say, dependent upon your own abilities. And then you put on the new man, which is dependent upon the words and God's ability. The scriptures. And you become a supernatural being. See, one of the main things we got to put on is a new mindset. You got to be willing to leave the old behind. Put off dependence upon me. I'm talking about you. And put on, I'm dependent upon God and his word. I'm dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I'm to accomplish much more than I could ever do of myself. I couldn't do what God called me to do, my own ability to in the past. 
I certainly know I can't do it now. I need God to move in my life. And watch what he does. Amen. The greatest miracle you'll ever know in your life is salvation. God changing virtually at the very root of who you are, changing who you are, changing your very nature. And if he can do that, you think he can't do the rest? That's hardly the greatest miracle you ever, you'll ever know. Now we should believe God for manifestation of every promise in the word. Amen. And once we do, we cannot just put off sin. We can put on healing. We can put on prosperity. We can put on the fruit of the Spirit. We can put on eternal life. Amen. We can enjoy every single day. Here's one. I think we have enough sourpuss Christians that haven't put off the old frown. They're sourpuss Christians because they're still living with a defeated mindset. You know, when you know you're going to win, you can't wipe the smile off your face. Amen. Have you ever played a game of some sort and, and maybe you knew you had the trump card you were going to win and no matter what everybody lists, you knew you had the you know, the rook or the trump card or whatever was going to give you the game, and you just kind of sat there smirking a little bit, trying to hide it. At the end, you threw that down and said, I take the pot, I win the game, whatever it might be. Well, we should have the same attitude regarding our Christian walk. We cannot be defeated. We've been made more than a conqueror. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. We should have a grin on our, our face all the time. And a frown is evidence you're still wearing the old clothing. You still have the old mindset. Amen. They should be calling us giggles. My new name is Cuddles. Yours can be giggles. You just can't quit chuckling because you know what God's about to do. With all this political gyrations going on right now, I've got a grin on my face. Doesn't matter what they try to do to the president. I know who wins. Amen. I know how this comes out. And I know that God has a plan. Amen. So ha, 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 ha. Keep on smiling. Amen. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. We were here last week. And so let me read the first few verses, and then we'll skip on down a little bit. Verse Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. What's he talking about? Putting on that shirt. Putting on the upper. Seek the things which are above. Seek what God would have you wear right now where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, how many know above there's no sickness? No lack, no oppression, no suicidal thoughts, no division, no rage. Seek those things. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. What is your heart's desire in life right now? I believe if you're really in the flow, I'm talking to anybody out there listening. I believe right now if your heart's really in the flow of what the Holy Spirit's doing, unless you're in a position of extreme lack, extreme sickness, you know, where there's a desperation, your number one heart's desire is to manifest the glory of God. You want the glory of God to come on your life. You want the glory of God to come into the world. You want this end time revival to manifest. I believe that's the heart desire of every revivalist right now. Amen. Unless maybe you're being faced with something very serious that's got your full attention because you've got to deal with it, that issue. Otherwise, you want the glory. Amen. Setting your desire, your heart on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. And Christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, mortify. What's mortify mean? 
put to death. Kill. Shut it down. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, put these to death. What's that putting off the old man? Put away those things. That's amazing. That should be obvious to us to put those away, right? But Paul felt it necessary to list them because even believers, if they don't make a decision to escape these, can fall back into them or never quit them. Verse number 9. Lie not to one another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Who created you? We're to be renewed in the image of him, of God. We're to look like Jesus. So when we put on this new man, it says, do you see this? Put on the new man, which is renewed through knowledge. See, as you spend time in the word, it changes how you think. It changes how you both perceive yourself and how you, uh, what you recognize is available to you. There, your mind being renewed in knowledge lets you expect supernatural forces to, to flow through your life. You expect to function in the supernatural. You expect to see results out of the kingdom of heaven. To the natural man, this seems ridiculous. What do you mean? You can believe God and speak the word and he'll heal you? Yes, I believe that. Do you believe that? Now, BJ, you're a medical person. How many people in the medical industry that don't know faith would think that was ridiculous? A bunch of them. You mean you say something and you think it's going to happen? If I believe it and say it, I know it will happen. Why? You've renewed your mind to a supernatural kingdom that is above the natural. But you've got to put off dependence upon the natural to move into the supernatural. And you walk with a new expectation. You walk with a new uh, knowledge that you have access to the power of God. Thank you, Jesus. So it says, he says, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. That's our assignment. Amen? Uh, verse 12 Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do you. He's telling us some of the things that are involved in being a new man, putting on the new man. But here again is the point. You need to access the power of the Holy Spirit to do this consistently. Or you'll give out. You'll feel like the biggest sucker around. Only the Lord can renew your mind to the place that you'll take these steps without concern for your own well-being or your own reputation. And above all these things, put on charity. Charity, there is agape love, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, again, we I've written a book back here, The Supernatural Power of Love. The genuine agape of God is supernatural. Amen. It's a supernatural force. It's a flow of the power of God fruit through you that can produce a supernatural fruit of the Spirit. Again, Romans chapter 13, our marriage passage. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Is not puffed up. Not easily offended, right? I mean, no, those, that's usually read in merit in weddings. Well, it doesn't say love tries to be patient. Love tries to be kind. It says it is. Which means love has in it, agape has in it, a supernatural component that that becomes automatic or easy. So if we're to put on charity, he's talking about putting on the supernatural. Renewing your mind that you can live in this presence of God. Now again, those two really, I believe, to some level are inseparable to dwell in the presence of God and to walk in love are almost synonymous. Because you get in the presence of God for long periods of time, it's going to produce love in your life. Amen? 
And you're not going to have the love of God at any high level unless you do spend time in God's presence. But we're to put on the supernatural forces of the Spirit as if we were getting a new outfit from heaven making a decision to put it on. Oh, glory to God. It talks about in Revelation that the saints are clothed with robes of righteousness. I... Uh, in the Imagine Heaven book, I believe it refers to these. Either that or something else I just read. May have been in God's Generals. That those that have seen the robes in heaven say they don't look like normal bath robes. Amen. They're majestic robes. They're phenomenal robes. Remember when Jesus was crucified, his garment was, was without seam. Very expensive garment. Uh... That was just a forerunner of what we're wearing in heaven. Phenomenal garments. Well, in the same way, we put on phenomenal garments here. Supernatural garments. Amen. Versus just a change or a decision to be a nicer person. I've tried to be that nicer person. I ran out. Do you follow me? I remember the first years I was saved, I didn't know I had access to supernatural forces. Supernatural love, supernatural love. I didn't know that. I didn't know I could live in the presence of God. Nobody told me that. So I was determined just to be nice. Amen. And I found out I could only smile so long. <laughs> I could only be sweet so long. And then eventually the old clothing would jump out of the closet and jump on me. Did you ever see Iron Man where he puts on that Iron Man suit and he hits the button and just appears on him? Well, I had the same thing, but it was the old man's suit. And I could go straight from speaking in tongues to old man in a moment if my tank got too low. But now we discovered we're not doing this by our own ability. And once I found out I was a new creation, once I found out I had access to supernatural power and I could live in the presence of God, Access about worshiping at will. He draw near to me as I drew near to him. It shifted everything. Not that I had this perfect. Not that the old man clothes doesn't try to, you know, rub off on me. But I don't believe they, that I put them on anymore. Amen. And uh, we're to be supernatural beings for God. So, some of the things we're to put on. Oh, the rest of that chapter in Colossians tells about things you can put on. Amen? But some things we're to put on is the lifestyle of praying in the Spirit. Put that on. Put on a lifestyle of worship unto God, especially if you don't feel like worshiping God. When you don't feel like worshiping God, there's no most important time to worship God. Amen? Because we're to be inundated with His presence all the time. Then if we don't feel worshipy, if His evidence, His presence isn't on us. And again, as we worship Him, He inhabits our praises. And as He comes in, He lifts up the old and puts on the new. And of course, I've given some of my testimonies in the past of how I've had some challenging moments and God says, worship me. And then only, then only came in. Remember the typewriter that typed only wise at times? Uh, in the same way, you've got your own testimonies. I've watched Pastor Rebecca for years. I'd come in here and I knew, I knew what was happening when I walked in. When I would come in, the music it was 135 decibels. And I could hear four rows back in the parking lot. And she'd be sitting up here toward the front, about third row. She'd be usually sitting right about here. Sitting here like this. She couldn't hear me coming. She couldn't hear if a freight train went by. Ah, oh, Jesus, Jesus. And I'd walk up and tap her on the shoulder. She'd jump like, I didn't know you were here. I'm going, duh. And she'd say, I'm having me some merry time. You understand Mary time? You know, Martha was busy, busy serving, but Mary chose the greater part to sit at Jesus' feet. 
Well, Pastor Rebecca's a server. She has the gift of Martha on her life. But she would reach a point she knew that her tank was getting low. She needed to exchange Martha mentality for some merry time. She would come here and sit in the worship of God until the presence of God came on her and she was refreshed. And I'm sure still, she still does it today. Amen. Casey probably hears it in his apartment at times. What's she doing? Putting on the new man. Worship allows you to put on the new man. When you pray in the Spirit, Jude verse 20 says that you uh, build up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You're building yourself up. Well, you're putting on the new man. Church involvement brings you into the corporate anointing of the body of Christ. I read a, I read a post on Facebook, I think it was yesterday, I didn't respond to because I didn't want to go into all the explanations of the exceptions, but somebody put on, on Facebook the post that just because you see somebody not attending church, that they're not spiritual. And if you see somebody in church, it doesn't mean they are spiritual. Well, that's true. That's a true statement. But at the same time, if there's a church you can go to and you're not going, that's called disobedience. Amen? Rebellion and stubbornness because the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And you can explain that any which way you want to, but we're commanded to go to church to be part of, the, of a thriving body because in the body of Christ is where the corporate anointing is. There's a supernatural provision being a part of the body that you don't have being a lone, lone ranger out there. Amen. You know, amputating yourself. And of course, the same thing is true that just because you're in church doesn't mean you'll be anointed. I mean, I believe, I believe in many churches there are more people, the devil sent more people in than God has. Amen. You need to go there because you go there, you won't be a threat to me. They can gossip and Compete all they want to, amen? Sometimes they try to come in here, but they don't stay very long. Because you won't let them use your ears as a garbage dump. Oh, here's something you've got to put on. Seed sowing. Tithing the seed sowing. You put that on once you become a new creation, right? And when you become a sower of seed and you do it by faith, you're really expecting God's going to multiply what you're giving out. And it's a new mentality. You've got to put off the selfish mentality to put on the sowing mentality. Really what you're doing is putting off fear and putting on faith. Because fear will keep you, seed, fear will keep your seed in your pocket. Faith will get it into the soil where it can do some good. And you've got to put on this mentality. You put off the old, you put on the new. Fasting. Uh-oh. Do you feel like cold wave come through here? Sometimes you've got to put off the dinner plate to put on more anointing. Do you really want the glory of God in your life? Sometimes it may be necessary to fast, fast some. Because when you fast, it puts the voices of the flesh to sleep. It puts off the flesh, and it awakens and strengthens the voice of the Spirit, and you put on the Spirit. Fasting is actually a step you can take to put off the old and put on the new. If you combine it with prayer. Prayer, praying in the Spirit, worship, all these should be combined with fasting. Because all of a sudden, some of the, some of the impediments pressing into the presence of God are out of the way. And you can hear better. I didn't see how much time I've got. You know, I hear people say, well, I can't fast because I get so hungry, I can't pray. Well, that happens. If you haven't fasted much, that will happen. And it may last anywhere from one to three or four days. But if you stay with it, if it's any kind of a real fast, see, here's it. Can I say something? Nobody get upset at me. Fasting Pepsis isn't much of a fast. 
especially if you switch to Cokes. <laughs> Amen? You know, fasting chocolate isn't really a big fast if you're still eating ice cream. <laughs> Even fasting desserts may be important to you physically. But, you know, a lot of times people will fast their dessert and eat double the other stuff. Genuine fasting is putting a stretch on the flesh to not get its way. And many times, depending upon what you fast, will determine how much shift it actually makes in your life, how much you're putting off and what you're putting on. And you get to choose, unless God speaks to you about something. When I first started fasting, I fasted. I was water only. I mean, I'd read a book about fasting. It said, don't even put mints in your mouth. It'll mess with the fast. I don't want to do I just went through all these four days of struggle. I don't want to put a mint in my mouth. So I'd brush my teeth carefully and spit it out and rinse good so I didn't taste even the toothpaste, you know, or swallow any. But then I found out I could fast. Other people were fasting. They were drinking juice. God, you talk about liberation. To drink some juice. Amen. Then people were fasting and they were, they were, you know, anything liquid. They would drink. You mean I can have liquids? Now I can have, you know. Anything I can run through a blender? It's amazing how many ribeyes you can put in a blender. <laughs> the point I'm making is, is your fast is just about changing your what you're eating, and it's not really about putting the flesh under any pressure. It may really not be much of a fast. And you get to choose how much you're going to put off that old man and put on the new through fasting. Amen? And, you know, maybe you want to start with juice, go to water, go back to juice, go to whatever, eat bread. You know, uh, I, did a, I did a fast one time for 40 days where I ate nothing but Ezekiel bread. Amen. Ezekiel bread for 40 days. You know what Ezekiel bread is? It's listed in the book of Ezekiel what God told him to eat, and it was all these different grains mixed together to make bread. And you go to the health food stores and buy Ezekiel bread pre-made, probably have it at Kroger. Ezekiel bread. I think, in, I think in the organic section they do. I tell you, if you go to the organic section, you'll find Ezekiel bread. In the cooler? Okay, yeah. So we got to 40, I was making my own. I bought all these different grains, bulk grains, put them in the processor, grind them up, make my own flour, made all these breads. And, uh, but I found out we were allowed to put any kind of spread on the bread we want. It's amazing how much jelly you can put on one piece of bread <laughs> if you set your heart to it. <laughs> now we held to it. I held to it pretty good. You follow me, but but the point is, is is that was a stretching fast. Eat nothing but bread for a month, and I don't know how many different jars of jelly I brought in the house during that month just to have a different flavor. But it produces change. It's putting on it, putting off and putting on. And however serious you want to take fasting can produce acceleration of change in your life. I'm convinced of it. Amen. In fact, you combine fasting with praying in the spirit and spending time in the word, it will put you in a supercharged fashion of accessing the power of God. Confessing scripture, that should be a daily routine we have regarding putting off and putting on. Amy, you may have to put off the TV and put on time to confess Scripture. Confess the Word over your life, over your families, over your situation. And, of course, we do put on good deeds, acts of kindness. Now, one of the main things we've got to put off and put on, which we'll cover next time, is you've got to put off your old ways of thinking. What you let your mind do and put on a new way of thinking. Again, just to give you a foreshadow of what I want to talk about is, is I used to let my mind do whatever it wanted to. It could develop imaginations. It could develop fantasies. It could develop revenge thoughts. It could event, go out there and superstar thoughts, whatever. And my mind could drift for hours. I mean, one of the main things I used to love to do if I would take a long trip, I used to drive, you know, a lot of long trips. 
Tennessee, 300 miles, Kansas, 700 miles, whatever. And uh, I found out the trip would really go faster because I used to travel by myself. It would really go faster if I would let my mind enter into an imagination, into a daydream. Maybe an hour would pass and realize I've driven an hour. Wasn't any stretch, any stress. Why? My mind was disengaged from the trip and was off on something else. But once I got saved, I realized I can't let my mind just drift where it wants to go. I need to make sure I think according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, that I think all those things which are good, true, honest, just, pure, love of good report, right? Full of virtue and praise. I think on these things. And as a believer, we've got to train our mind. First, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to renew our thinking to monitor what we're thinking and train our mind only to allow thoughts in that align with the Word of God and to cast down the others. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge or the Word of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ Jesus. Right, 2 Corinthians 10. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is one of the primary things of importance you've got to put off and put on. You put off letting your mind do what it wants to, and you put on, I have control of that soul. Because I'm in control of it, it'll do what I tell it to do. Amen. That will make a monumental shift in your walk with God. Well, it's right of time for tonight. So, Father, I thank you in your church. There are none sick. There are none in lack, none oppressed, none in fear, none in strife. Everyone manifesting the supernatural agape of God. Let each one here put off the old man and his deeds and put on a new expectation of functioning in the supernatural. We thank you, we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Oh, you got the video ready, Pastor Rebecca?